Hello, and welcome to The Mind of a Therapist, a podcast where I interview psychotherapists and helping professionals and what they're passionate about in order to provide you with messages of encouragement and hope. I'm your host, Andrew Earle. The Mind of a Therapist is sponsored by Psychological Counseling Services, healing hearts and transforming lives. Look into our intensive at pcsrl.com. In today's interview, I interviewed Doug Withrow. Doug is a licensed marriage and family therapist who has an MS in counseling and a master's of divinity. Doug seeks to create a safe place where discovery can happen in his work, a place to heal emotional pain, come to new understandings of who I am, and develop new skills for coping with life's surprises. So without further ado, here's my interview with Doug. Welcome to uh, the Mind of a Therapist podcast. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, I love this yeah. yeah. And to get started, I, I thought of a new question I'm going to try out um, asking uh, you know, people on the podcast right now. So you're the guinea pig All here. Right. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, so I, I'm curious um, how you view change. Like, oh. what, what does it take? For people, for families, for couples to to change, big big question. But yeah, well, yeah, that's a big question. I the two words that jumped to my mind um, are courage and intentionality. Mm. Uh, that it to say, hey, I need to make changes is just a courageous thing to say to admit that I have to uh, look at mm. myself. Um, and in, in that process, the intentionality piece is, I know making change is not instantaneous, that we have these ingrained paths that we go down, and um, there's going to be a lot of trial and error on that. And that's, that can be intimidating, it can be create helplessness, it can go, oh, I get so tired doing this. But that's just part of it. Mm-hmm. So that's that's where I kind of start with it, mm-hmm. and it's hard, and it's rewarding. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, I mean, well, that rings true for me. <laughs> uh huh. Courage, uh, intentionality. I mean, changes from from my experience, and you know, from my conversations with others is. De- definitely requires courage because it's an unfamiliar act, right? It's something that is is different than what we're right. we're used to, and it often takes that intentionality of looking, taking responsibility for something we don't like in our lives uh-huh. and relationships, and 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 making those steps to to to, to yeah, yeah make a difference in that arena to make a difference. Yeah. Uh, the, and that when we're making those shifts, when we're saying I need, I want to do something different in my life, I think we we can't do it alone typically. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, I guess we can, it, but it's exponentially more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> and if we have people in our lives who are supporting that change, who kind of help us see our blind spots, then we're more likely to kind of follow through. There's accountability with that. There's support in that um, and encouragement and to say, hey, I know you can do this. Because when we get into those dark spots and think, man, can I really make this change? You know, it's just who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, some Sometimes we need somebody, I know I do, I need somebody to say, hey, no, this is just part of the process. I know it's tiring. I know you're struggling. Um, but keep doing this. Have you ever seen the video Backwards Bike? No. Okay. Anybody listening or you, look <laughs> yeah. up Backwards Bike on YouTube. Okay. Uh-huh. And it talks about the rewiring that uh, needs to happen. Um, ba- wait, I'm curious about the bike though. What is it? Well, it, th- there's a guy, I don't know his name. He's an engineer and he has these mechanic friends and they put an ex- a gear, an extra gear on the handlebars so when you turn left, the tire turns right. <laughs> and when you turn right, the tire turns left. They're about his journey in learning how to rewrite a bike. 
Wow. Which speaks right to what the question was. Yeah. You know, th- that, okay, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to get up every morning and I'm going to try to do this differently. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get better and better. And that, that growth mindset is allows us to be adaptable. That I'm just a human being and I'm learning to do some new things. And the reality is we're learning to do, do new things every day. Am I going to want to do that? intentionally here's what I want to learn and rather than just I'm going to randomly learn some things without any intention in my life yeah having that focus and intention on, on this is what I'm changing and then inviting others uh, into that that process f- so that you can receive support in that direction because possible to make change alone but you know especially yeah. with you know changes relating to mental health issues, relationship right. problems. We we need to lean on other people, both professionals, therapists, but also community to to support us in these yeah. changes. And yeah, I was thinking that's that's that courage piece for, for me, I know, you know, in our society we have this individual focus, right? Mm-hmm. The the you know, rugged individual. You pull right. yourself up by your bootstraps by yourself, do things alone. And I don't, I, I haven't found that that works, yeah. works for me in terms of, you know, yeah. psychological healing and change in my life. And I don't know anybody personally or professionally who does life well and does it alone. Mm. And, and, I'm, and I'm not talking about being extrovert or introvert. I mean, that there's room for that kind of different personalities. But having those people in your life who are, who know you, Mm. and that, you know, that's a vulnerable place to be, Mm. is to say, I want to be known by you. And I get it. I know that's my stuff, is I don't want to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, when when I'm speaking like with clients, I'm really preaching to myself Uh, a lot uh of the times. Yeah. Come on, Doug, be vulnerable. Yeah. You gotta go home and open yourself up some more and that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, and I think I think as men too, we have additional obstacles. We've been trained our whole lives to hold in emotions and uh-huh. uh, you know not not be vulnerable. That's a, equated right. with with weakness, with femininity, which is completely wrong in my eyes. Um, right. But yeah, that's. That's unfamiliar for most men, I think, in our society. And I think we're flipping the script a little bit. That we we see, uh, not that we're anywhere near where it's predominant, but where we begin to see the courage it takes to be vulnerable. I mean, a soldier is not brave who hides the whole time. Mm. The soldier who's brave is the one who goes out in the open and they may get hurt. Mm-hmm. And I think that's our vulnerability is, are we brave? Are we going, are we kind of putting ourselves out there knowing that we may not, we may get hurt. I, mm. I just think, um, I wish you could, but you cannot do intimacy without vulnerability. Mm. Um, and believe me, I wish you could, uh, you know, and I, I, I Personally, and I work with a lot of people who wish you could do. I wish I could have this intimacy. I want that, and I. But I don't want to risk anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Instead of saying, yeah, "Here's what I'm," because you know, if you put yourself out there, then someone may say, "Yeah, I don't like that," or "I don't like mm-hmm. you." Mm-hmm. Um, I disagree with you. Mm-hmm. And that's a scary place to go. Yeah, and. You work with um, a lot of people who are facing shame, uh, this Mm -hmm. story that there's uh, something wrong with me that, uh, you know, uh, rather than I I did something wrong, there's something bad about me, I'm bad, I'm unlovable, I'm undeserving, Mm -hmm. this sort of message. And uh, from my experience, it seems like this this keeps people, the shame keeps people from, from connecting kind of, uh, you know, is more of an inward focus. Will you speak more on your experiences, 
uh, with with shame, how it shows up, what it looks like in people's lives and relationships? Yeah, I... This idea of shame versus guilt, which Brene Brown talks a lot about, mm. um, is I made a mistake versus I am a mistake. Um, and then when we've made a mistake in our relationships that's hurt somebody else and they're needing to talk about the pain that they're in. So they're talking about the mistake we made a lot. <laughs> and, and so it just, it kicks all that shame up. Um, but the healing is in being able to talk about it. Mm. And, and so to help, to help couples for someone to help someone who's in their shame, say, how, how do you put your shame, shame off to the side here and, f and allow that person to do their healing is real. It's, it's difficult work. Cause I don't, I don't like hearing about how I've made a mistake. I don't mm -hmm. know. You know, and ideally we'd like to say, okay, I made a mistake. It's not who I am. Let's just move on. <laughs> But when I've made a mistake that hurt you, part of the process is I need you need to be able to talk about your hurt with me. And so you have to navigate this. I'm in my shame. I'm trying to let go of it. At the same time, you're needing to talk to me about the thing that I'm shameful about. Mm -hmm. And that, I think in therapy, that's why therapy is so important in those situations. Uh, not that it can't happen in other circles, but you sure. need a safe place wherever that is to kind of contain that conversation um, and, and help the person who's in shame keep putting it down, keep putting it down, staying in that listening place. And the person who's talking about their pain talk about their pain versus shaming and talking about how horrible mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is that, I'm not sure if that answers oh, your that question. Does. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious, what are some ways that you've seen people that that you some ways that you support people in putting the shame aside because I know the shame can be pretty overwhelming for folks at times and really get in the way of them hearing that other person. Mm -hmm. um, be curious to to hear some of your experiences with that. Well, therapeutically, uh, kind of in in the session in counseling sessions, it's um, slowing down the process. It, when somebody starts getting defensive or reactive and um, or lashing out or just shutting down, just kind of going to that shame stance where you slump your shoulders and won't make eye contact and stuff like that, is just to stop the conversation and to notice it and to help that person begin to notice when they're going into shame and what they're doing. Because I think it, when we go into our shame, we don't always realize we're going into our shame. Mm. We're feeling justified in being defensive. We're feeling justified in being angry or lashing out. Um, or we're just shutting down and we're not even aware of what we're feeling. And so if you can help people begin to recognize when it's happening, then we get better at recognizing it kind of outside of the therapy session or in groups or with family members. And we can go, hey, wait a minute, I'm not being really present with you right now. I need a second to take care of myself. And then you do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. It can be self-talk. It can be taking some deep breaths. It can be a prayer or whatever works for you mm -hmm. to kind of get grounded again and to say, right now I'm just listening to their pain. Mm -hmm. I'm still a good person. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm okay and I can handle their hurt. Because mm -hmm. um, I want to hear them. Mm -hmm. That's good. Step one recognition because yeah. shame can be s sneaky and it's hard to notice when we're in that that place uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and so recognizing the defensiveness or criticism that we might be engaging in to mm -hmm. kind of uh, keep from the shame and uh, taking that moment to to recognize that experience and then I'm hearing kind of It'll be diverse as in terms of what works for people, breathing exercises, focus, you know, some sort of message that's important for them to mm -hmm. tell themselves so that they can uh, kind of ground and mm -hmm. then re-engage and listen mm -hmm. to their, their partner, their 
their family member, their friend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then how about um, how about for a partner who has been 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 hurt? Uh, you know, maybe be betrayed in some way, whether it's infidelity, whether it's um, some sort of lying with finances. What do you often find is, is helpful for that person because they, you know, frustrated, right, rightly frustrated, mm-hmm. right? And that, that criticism that they may be directing at that person the, 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 you know, the person uh-huh. who is the, the offender probably is not helping the situation. What, what do you find is helpful for the person in that, in that position? Well, I think in, in the interaction is there does need to be a space where they can kind of just be raw in their emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but to stay in their long term as much as somebody, when they're in that reactive place, they feel like, I got to get it out, I got to get it out. That's not really where the ultimate healing is. kind of like, if I stay angry and never get past my anger, it kind of leads to bitterness, contempt, yeah. and those kind of things. And I just stay stuck. I'm just going to be always in that place. And so then it, I think it's eventually you start shifting it to talking about myself I've been hurt I'm scared and what's underneath the anger I need here's what I need and and, you know kind of in traditional communication using iMessages but but not just as a checkbox I'm using iMessages but more from a really self-awareness place and I think that's our best grounding is when I'm talking from my pain when I'm when I'm owning it and I'm not talking about you because frankly, if I'm if I'm talking about you, I'm still making it all about you, and so I need to make it about me, and not not in a condemning way, but just to say I'm hurt. I get to talk about my pain. I get to talk about how lonely it feels. I get to talk about here's what I need, um, and that's where we get really grounded. Because I, you can say you shouldn't feel that way, and I just say, well, I, maybe not, but I do. <laughs> Mm. You shouldn't need that. Maybe not, but I do. All I can tell you is I need this right now. Mm. Um, and then you, I think from that place, then you see, does this person show up? And can they hear me talking about me? Can they hear me asking my needs? Can they meet at least some of those needs? And if they can't, then I have to decide, does this relationship make sense? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I know that's a hard conversation, um, but the only way to, to really decide if the relationship makes sense is, um, is this person hearing me? And is this really a safe place for me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, figuring out, uh, you know, identifying what my needs are rather than that, that focus on here's what the person, and there, you're saying there's a place to, you know, sit with that anger and have that expression mm-hmm. of emotion, and then there does need to be a shift at at some point towards that identification of what what I'm needing in a relationship. Um, and is there a like when you're working with couples? Is there a general timeline that is there's some pattern with for like how long it takes? people to kind of shift from that anger resentment seat to more of let me look look inward i'm sure it's pretty subjective depending on the, <laughs> well, it the is it's so that, dependent on the person yeah. i do i do think if you're if you're still raging i'm going to use extremes two years from the offense <laughs> then you're probably stuck uh. Um, now that doesn't mean you won't have times when you are reflecting and your anger gets stirred up again but if it's still in that raw uncontained place that's what that's what it's about it's not about not being angry it's being able to be grounded and express that anger from a contained place or express that hurt from a contained place and so every person it, it impacts differently and I've you know I've 
sat with people, I'm thinking, does that really hurt? It doesn't sound like one of the big bombs people have dropped on anybody. Um, but what matters is, or things have been huge bombs dropped on people, and they recover relatively quickly from it. Mm. And so then you start looking at um, internal resources, support resources, trauma history. Because, man, if, if the offense taps into somebody's trauma history, it, it takes so much longer to recover. Or if an offense happens to somebody who's disconnected emotionally, and all of a sudden that emotion is just exploding and they have no experience of re- regulating it, that takes a long time mm-hmm. to address. And so the, kind of the other, the other aspect of beginning to look at yourself once you've been kind of expressed that initial hurt and the anger um, is then to say, I don't, this is an opportunity for me to grow as a person. Not fair. I shouldn't have to be doing this. But it still is an opportunity, and I'm going to start looking at my my history, my relationship history, my family history, and really kind of know myself better, so I can take care of myself in the present. Mm-hmm. And it's not to go back and wallow in that stuff, mm-hmm. but it is to go back to to sit with some of that history, so I can learn from it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then everything we can learn about our history helps us in the in the moment. Sure. So you yeah using this. Uh event that was um, not ideal, unfair, betrayal of some point, to to learn more about mm-hmm. uh, oneself, learn more about one's uh, trauma history, mm-hmm. and get more in touch with um, what what one is needing um, mm-hmm. as they're, you know, with a couple continuing in that relationship, and, you know, maybe even having to consider whether or not it makes to makes sense to to stay mm-hmm. in the relationship with right. with that person. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's a that's a, a challenging process uh, to yeah. you know realize this person had been giving them a chance for so long and you know the the they're not meeting my needs. Right. And uh. and, and you know and, and it goes back to that it's intimacy, and so I, particularly using the word betrayal, when there's been betrayal, I love this person, I want them in my life, and they've created some of those damaging parts to me. Mm. And so that's just, do I let go, but I let go of this person who I love, and, Mm. you know, and everybody has to kind of come to their own answer to that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you, the question you answered, I hear in therapy a lot, is how long do I hold on? Mm. And I say that I can't answer that for you. I, yeah. I can give you some tools. I can, we can talk through your pain. We can talk about what you need. Mm-hmm. And you can hold on for as long as you want to hold on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there are some things to look at within any couple's therapy is am I continuing to grow is the first part am I continuing to understand myself better and showing up in a healthier way and then is is my partner or it can be a friend or another family member sure, sure. are they continuing to grow not that they're perfect but they are invested in I want to, I want to continue to grow I want to be a better person um, I know I'm not perfect, and I'm going to keep leaning into this anyway. Mm-hmm. And then you start going, okay, maybe there's something we can do here. But if, if every time you talk, it's resistance, minimizing, defensiveness, um, or rage, or the unhealthy responses, then you think, okay... I, at some point I can't keep doing this yeah and then I think it is important to have that conversation on the table you, you don't have to just drop a bomb one day and say you know you can say hey I'm not sure if I can keep doing this and we got to talk about how how sure. much I'm checking out uh-huh. um, and also to make that decision not in a in a reactive moment 
but if you want to end a relationship, um, it is um, done not in rage, but in, you know, I've been reflecting on this. I feel really grounded in myself. And ending a relationship, I, it's obvious with a, a partner, you can end it. But also you can say, you know, there's a family member who I find abusive or shaming or whatever. And so you may not completely end the relationship. It's just not going to be a close relationship. You know, mm -hmm. you go to family functionings and functions and you're cordial, but they're not like one of your inner circle people. Sure, sure. Um, and, as, and there's some grief to that. Sure. Uh, that, that, that's for every person to decide. Um, and I've seen people work for years trying to keep finding that. Um, and then I see some people who, after three weeks, say, I can't do this. And that, that's when we do cause harm in our relationships, we, we lose control of the consequences. And we don't know whether a person is able to repair it or not. And so you know, I'll have people say, why can't they just forgive me? Why don't they just... And I say, you, you don't get to make that choice. You made the choice that was hurtful. Mm. But, you know, I, to be able to say, I get why you would want, not want to be in this relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, yeah, I was just curious. What, what postures do you find most helpful that people take who have, you know, gone outside the marriage where there's been secrecy affairs? What, what posture do you find is most helpful for them to take with their, their partner? Um, humble. Uh -huh. um, patient. And if you can stay humble and patient and, you know, com again, committed to intentionally working on yourself, that, that is real helpful in the process. Because I, I find people who've offended a relationship, patience is the number one thing. When are, you, are we ever going to be over this? And I, with betrayal or infidelity, I just think, no. <laughs> you, you get better at it, and you can have really close, intimate relationships, and then you may be watching a movie 15 years later, and there's infidelity in the movie, and the person goes, why did you do that? And if you can, if you really are in that humble place of remorse, that moment can be a three-minute moment. It can be, I know that has to hurt. Is there anything I can do? I'm so sorry. Or it can blow everything up if you get defensive and say, oh my gosh, are you talking about this again? When are you ever going to get, because then that creates mistrust again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's some wounds you know it's kind of the old war hero thing you get shot in the hip and every time it rains you limp <laughs> mm. and there's just something that triggers our trauma yeah yeah and you know, that's true of childhood trauma uh -huh. and it's true of trauma throughout our lives there's sometimes something triggers a trauma and if there's more work personal to do you do it mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't <laughs> sometimes you just you get so tired of it, you just kind of say it and try to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and it just hurts. And I think if you ignore the hurt, that's the problem. Mm. Yeah, hurt hurt often. And I think problems in general seem to grow when they're, they're ignored, right? They're, ignored, right. <laughs> they're knocking on the door. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, so patience, uh, yeah, with... Like you were saying, with an affair, a decade or so after, there might there there will likely be triggers that come up that that mm -hmm. you know are reminders for your partner, and so having that long term patience, and then will, will you say more about uh, how you view humility? Um, what what humility is to you? Humility. Um... That's a great question. I think I know it when I see it. Uh -huh. um, I, it's 
there is a surrender to it. There is a, I don't have the answers. Mm. I don't have all the answers. Um, there's a curiosity to humility that I, I seek to understand somebody else and their mm. perspective. Um, mm. And it's, it's not a self-deprecating thing. Yeah. It's, it's, I realize that I'm a special, unique human being, and I have some great qualities and gifts and so forth. Um, and I also realize that I don't know everything, and I have a lot to learn. Mm. And in holding on to that, holding on to my uniqueness is good, holding on to my shadow and realizing I can do hurtful things, that there's I think there's probably some maturity in that mm. um, rather than thinking I know nothing and everybody has something to teach me or I am all that and I know everything or I'm this shadow and I'm worthless if we get focused on any one of those pieces that's problematic yeah yeah but kind of holding on to this messy mixed bag uh -huh. and acknowledging it yeah is is healthy yeah no that makes sense not not going into that that shame also not going into the you know i i, I know everything uh yeah. um but a place of surrender of of curiosity of engagement with the process mm -hmm. uh, uh that makes that makes a lot of sense because yeah. Yeah, i think oftentimes when people you know, the word humility comes up, there's this thought of like, oh, you're just self-deprecating and, yeah. you know, you don't stand for anything. And uh, my wife and I were talking about that uh, recently of humility and, and I, yeah, I was having the thoughts of, yeah, it, does, it doesn't mean that, you know, self-deprecation is something, it, and I think it's, you know, I think it involves, uh, you know, with knowing what, even knowing what our needs are and mm -hmm. knowing what we stand for and what we we value while simultaneously like holding space for others and especially in yeah. that context of but be, be, betrayal you know yeah having having that curiosity and that openness to what's going on right. for for your partner and I th and one of the things when you say that when someone has betrayed their partner or when someone is in addiction typically that that has happened because they don't know how to do that the do what exactly do, to, to be in that humble place to uh. be curious to be vulnerable to be intimate they don't know how to do that so they're taking care of that in unhealthy ways uh. they're kind of numbing their own pain uh -huh. and then now you have this this huge nuclear blow up in the relationship and what the partner betrayed partner needs is someone who's empathetic and patient and vulnerable and intimate and the, what created the betrayal was someone who didn't know how to do that anyway so now I'm needing this from you with from a person who's just not capable of doing it yet mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think that's where each person in the relationship needs a ton of support. Yeah. Outside of the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where one person is learning how to do intimacy and vulnerability, and the other person is having people who are kind of surrounding them and, and loving them and saying, no, you get to be angry, you get to be hurt, you get to... Um, and that goes back to that grounding piece and both mm -hmm. people getting grounded. And also the person who's done the betrayal needs... Because they're not getting... <laughs> positive feedback generally from the person they've betrayed sure. so they need people in their lives who say you're not an idiot you're yeah you, you made idiotic choices sure. <laughs> but sure. you're not an idiot sure uh -huh. <laughs> yeah and p who are those people in their lives who are supporting them in the direction they're they're heading oh, towards yeah, yeah, intimacy yeah. towards vulnerability with their partner I, that's often something that I'm curious, curious about when I'm having conversations with people is who, who are these people in your life? You know, I hear this is the direction you're wanting to move. 
who are the people in your life who come alongside you who are most likely to see these changes that you're making because you know going back to that uh I forget exactly what context of our conversation, but the you know the circles of intimacy mm-hmm. or narrative therapy is called the the club of life membership. You know the idea that we accord people certain um, statuses in our life uh, mm-hmm. who've been we've been in significant relationships with. Sometimes people are too high, and you know that can right. be damaging because it gets in the way of us you know meeting our own needs. Um, and sometimes, you know, we've had traumatic relationships with people and that kind of gets centered in there. Right. And so that process of, okay, what are the parts of these relationships that have shaped how I see myself and how can I kind of, you know, push those further outside or completely outside uh-huh. these circles while bringing in, uh, current relationships, but also relationships with people from the past who have been nurturing, supporting, right. championing us and and keeping keeping those pieces close as we are we, yeah. we're we're in our healing journey. Right, I agree, and I and it it's it, it's it's important, like you're saying, to keep those people close. Um, and you know, we're talking about right now. You and I are talking about this kind of from a a theoretical place. Sure, sure, and. It, it is hard work. I mean, when we say yeah. therapy is hard work, it's just hard work to do this. And mm-hmm. I, you know, I struggle with it personally. Um, and it is just kind of keep getting up and doing <laughs> doing the next right thing. And then some days, a lot of days, I don't. Mm-hmm. And I, I have to keep kind of pushing to get through it and sometimes yeah. you know it feels like it's you know three steps forward two steps back or sometimes you feel like you're at a snail's pace um you know it'd be interesting to have our wives in here part of this conversation they would go oh yeah that sounds real good theoretically <laughs> um <laughs> yeah but yep, it yep. is you know, that's the vulnerability. That's the... It's terrifying at times. Mm. Um, and just to be honest about that, I, I the people who, who do therapy and are willing to look at themselves that way, um, it, that's the courage piece that I mm. initially... T- it just takes a lot of courage to do that. And some days you have more courage than others. Um, but then you keep getting back on and trying it again. You fall down, keep getting up, and trying again. Backwards bike. Need- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I appreciate that because yeah, this, you know, a lot of this has been theoretical, but you know, it's yeah that that that's largely my perspective with you know all therapists. We all are humans too, right? right. And I don't think anyone's um, you know, not affected by some level of suffering in their life and uh-huh. difficulties in relationships. I think that, especially within the modern context we live in, there's just there are so many obstacles for us, um, and just continuing to put one foot in front of the other and creating more intimacy. Um, yeah, I, I resonate with that. The, yeah. It's like three three steps forward at times. So, yes, I'm doing well. Yeah. You know, I'm creating this world that I want to live in. Things are really looking up. And right. then the next week, you know, it's like, oh, this, <laughs> this is really, <laughs> this, this is, is exhausting. This is rough. What in the world am I yeah, doing this? Yeah. But, and that being said, it's not, it's not all drudgery. And because that, yeah, can, that yeah, can be yeah. kind of this pessimistic mm. thing. There are moments mm. where it is, you see it and you feel it and you think, oh, mm-hmm. this is awesome. Yeah. This is this is what it's about. Yeah. And it, and that is the nature of living is that there are these peaks and valleys. Mm. And if you're in a valley, there's probably going to be a peak. And if you're in a peak, there may be a valley. Yeah. Um, 
but it, but if you can embrace that as more of an adventure than a oh I got to get through this to get yeah. back to the peak and say no that every movie book play that talks about the human experience at some point in the middle of it it looks hopeless yeah um, sometimes at the end of it it looks hopeless uh-huh. but there's always the it 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 keeps turning around I didn't get into philosophy there it does keep turning mm. it keeps turning and even in the darkest times there have been moments where I smiled yeah yeah um, I felt connected mm. That I like the adventure metaphor. That's mm-hmm. that's good, and uh, yeah, I was talking with my wife recently of how uh, I heard this on TikTok. I just started uh, watching TikTok videos because I, I know it's popular. Uh-huh. And I wanna, you know, and they're they're pretty funny, and some of them are really creative. And anyways, this guy was talking about how um, oftentimes we want the the Z before the A B C D E F G, you know, and uh, it's such a good reminder for me because I often, you know, have this thinking of, okay, once I get here, you know, things are really going to shape up, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. once, once I get this financial goal or I get to this point in my career or, you know, I own a home or whatever it right. is, right? All these stories I've been told. Um, but that, that thinking takes me away from the present moment and... Yeah, like you said, even in, for me too, even in the darkest times of my life, I still had good times here and there, you know? Yeah. And and that important reminder of, like, I just love when I can really tune into the moment, you know, uh-huh. and uh, just enjoy a conversation, enjoy what I'm eating, connect with someone, connect with the, you know, a tree or, you know, anything in the natural world. So, right. yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're we're getting to the end of the interview, Doug. Um, the question I always like to end with the podcast with is, "What's a message of hope you'd like to leave the listeners with?" Um, wow, <laughs> which is a little bit what we're talking about. Yeah. What that that I, I firmly believe we're cap- we're all capable, and um, that healing can happen. And I've, I've, I've witnessed it and experienced it. Um, and that when we uh, act courageously, when we kind of dive into that stuff, change does happen. Mm. Change happens. Um, and again, it's not about I change and I arrive. Yeah, it's yeah, about yeah. I, I just, I keep, I keep changing and growing and I'm a little mm. bit better and I enjoy moments more and um, I'm a lot different now than I was when I was five and when I was 20 and um, I I remember my mom said one time and I was just recently talking about this she was I think 85 or 86 at the time and she goes the closer I get to the the older I get the real the realization I have is that I'm farther from who I want to be, but I'm more content with who I am. Mm. And I thought, wow, that is profound. Be- and I would love to have that mindset in my 80s, but I, I wrestle with that mindset of, I want to be closer to who I want to be. Mm. And I think the, the more we, the wisdom we have and the maturity we have and the growth we have, we realize that there's a lot of growth still to go, mm-hmm. but we can be content just where we're at right now. Mm. Uh, and so I find hope in that. Yeah. Well, yeah thank you for that message. Yeah. And uh, if, if the listeners uh, wanted to get in touch with you at all, is there a place to learn about uh, your your work, where would be a good place to direct them? Well, I think the, the starting point would be at Psychological Counseling Services, the website, which is pcsintensive.com, and they can look me up in the bios, um, or they can call the the office that number that's listed there, and and I'd be glad to, to talk. Perfect. And then do you have any uh, blogs, any... Uh, 
thing that you've written? That, no, uh, not not really. No, I, that surprises not, me. That, not yeah, your, not that's your, your not thing. my thing. Yeah, um, you know, I've been I've done a couple of guest video blog kind of things, but uh, kind of similar to this, but uh -huh. not my own stuff uh, so you're venturing out into the yeah yeah into the, the podcast. Web podcast world right now right, right, right. Oh, i'm privileged that's nice <laughs> yeah yeah cool. thank you for inviting me All to right. do this this yeah. is awesome I appreciate it doug uh -huh. please press the subscribe button as well as rating and reviewing our podcast this helps others connect with what you've been hearing if you have any questions, please contact us at themindofatherapist at gmail.com. These questions will be kept anonymous. I want to thank Eric Price for the wonderful music you hear in this podcast. Additionally, this podcast was created to provide accurate and authoritative information on the subject matter. Although we are interviewing licensed therapists, they are not your therapists. This podcast is not intended to serve as direct medical advice and should not be used as a substitute for direct professional help. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, publisher, guests, or PCS are rendering legal, clinical, or other professional information. If you need a professional, we encourage you to find one. Visit Psychology Today to connect with a licensed clinician near you.